Hello. Can you hear me up there? Yes. Oh, magic, silence. Okay, I think we'll, I think we really need to start. I realize people will still be arriving, but we, we're, we don't have so much time, so we'll start now. Hello, I'm Sue Scott. I'm the president of the European Sociological Association, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this ESA conference. Do you know, one of the, one of the tricky things that I found about being ESA president is working out what to call it. Because in the UK, we say ESA, some people say ESA, some people say ESA. I say all three now, but for tonight, I'm going to say ESA because we're in, we're in Manchester, okay? So delighted to welcome you to the splendid city of Manchester where it is not raining, um, and to this magnificent Bridgewater Hall. It's, it really is stunning to be standing on this stage looking at all of you. Um, when, um, when I attended um, what was called the first European Conference of Sociology in Vienna in August 1992, before the ESA had really come into existence, um, I was then a lecturer here at the University of Manchester. And little did I think that I would be standing here 27 years later as president of what has become a very significant organization and a home from sociologists across Europe and beyond. And when I was sorting some things out recently, I found the badge from that very conference in, in Vienna all those years ago. Um, there was a moment in December 2017 when I was concerned that we might not have a venue for this conference. But all was resolved when I discovered that Professor Gary Pollock um, here in Manchester was putting together a bid for the 2021 conference and was happy to bring it forward. And here we are. Since then, there have been a fair few Cassandras telling us that colleagues would not want to come to Manchester because of Brexit, because of the weather, both of which are, as you know, extremely changeable. But, <laughs> but neither seem to have deterred what I think is 3,024 sociologists and fellow travelers from registering for this conference, which is just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. The theme of the conference is as relevant, if not more relevant, than when it was first developed. In Europe, as, in elsewhere, as elsewhere in the world, boundaries, both material and symbolic, are being created and reinforced or even potentially recreated, as with the issue of the border between the north and south of the island of Ireland, which is such a problem in the context of Brexit. As sociologists, we are very familiar with the barriers created by the ways in which gender, race, and class impact individuals and communities. And now we need to contend with the increasing barriers to knowledge, ideas, and open debate which the spread of populism and post-truth inculcate. Sociological knowledge is undermined by the lack of trust in our expertise. And this is perhaps even more of a challenge for us, as we can't simply stand up for normal science, but need to be critical and to express complexity and nuance. One example, which is particularly close to my research and political heart, comes from the Hungarian government in the context of deciding to close gender studies programs, they issued the following statement. People are born either male or female, and we do not consider it acceptable to talk about socially constructed genders rather than biological sexes. This at a stroke dismisses decades of sociological research and thinking about gender and sexuality. Belonging is an increasingly contested and complex concept. Migration, of course, is not at all new in Europe, both inward and outward. But we are currently seeing people uprooted and literally cast adrift, people who are not being welcomed and are therefore unable to build a new sense of belonging. In the UK, we are facing the possibility of not belonging to Europe, which I personally find extremely difficult to contemplate. I felt European for most of my adult life, 
but this has certainly been intensified during my time as ESA president. Having the opportunity to belong to communities of choice is a privilege, and as sociologists, we have that opportunity across the world. And I hope that many of you have a strong sense of belonging to this community of sociologists under the umbrella of the ESA. The backdrop to many of the issues which we'll be discussing at the conference are the overarching challenges to democracy. And it's worth noting that this conference sits between two other important events here in Manchester, both of which are strongly connected to the development of democracy and citizenship. Last Friday was the 200th anniversary of the Peterloo Massacre, and I hope you'll find out more about it while you're here and go and look at the new memorial which has been erected in commemoration just across the way from here. 200 years ago, last Friday, people assembled in peaceful protest on St. Peter's Fields in Manchester, a very short distance from where we are this evening, to demand, among other things, the right to vote. 17 people were killed that day by soldiers sent to stop what the powerful defined as an insurrection. Many others lost their livelihoods through the in injuries that they sustained. <coughs> Peterloo was a powerful example of working people's struggle for citizenship against the barriers which the rich and powerful raised against them. It is important that we reflect on the state of democracy now across Europe, where it seems all too easy to define some people as non-citizens. Also in Hong Kong, where peaceful protesters are being attacked on the streets for supporting democracy, and of course, here in Britain, where our Prime Minister is set on pitting individuals boasted by, bolstered by populist ideology against a democratically elected parliament, and where European citizens may have no right to remain if we crash out on the 31st of October. As our conference ends, Manchester Pride weekend begins, and I hope that some of you will be able to stay on to engage with this celebration of LGBTQ lives, culture, and politics in a city which has long had a positive attitude to non-normative sexualities and alternative expressions of gender, and in which one of the first gay villages in the UK develops and still thrives. I have joined with RN23 to host my president's semi-plenary on sexual citizenship, and on Friday morning, it will include a speaker from Manchester Pride and will be open to the public. While we're on the subject of democracy, let me remind you of the importance of exercising your right to vote in the ESA election, if you haven't already done so. Um, our new digital election tool is very easy to use, even I managed to do it. Can I also remind you of the importance of attending the General Assembly on Friday lunchtime, and because we really want to encourage people to come, we've moved it into a bigger space. We're going to hold it here in the Bridgewater Hall. As sociologists, it is of course not only the politics of democracy and such like that interest us, but the narratives, the changes and the continuities which shape the politics, and also the lived experience of the current moment. It is this arc and the ways in which we connect the landscape with the detail that make our discipline so important in these troubled times. This is why we need to work together to ensure that sociology and social science generally is taken more seriously by governments, publics, and indeed universities. The work that the ESA has been doing with the European Alliance for Social Science and Humanities is very important in this regard. As sociologists, we can sometimes suffer from being squeezed into a model designed for the STEM disciplines and are often located in institutions run by those who do not fully understand or, or fully appreciate what we have to offer. In the UK context, we have battled to ensure that the social sciences and humanities um, are not assessed in research evaluation on the basis of impact factors of journals or other metrics, 
but on the quality of the text itself. However, there is a strong tendency for university managers to ignore this and to discourage public publication outside of high impact factor journals, which makes little sense in a discipline as diverse uh, and with as many subfields as sociology. This emphasis on impact factors has been taken up widely across Euro European research evaluation exercise and tends to send, set up colleagues to fail. Indeed, one positive aspect of the enforcement of Plan S, the plan for open access by the beginning of 2021, um, in the many European countries which have signed up to it, is that it also entails signing up to the DORA agreement, which will end the use of impact factors. I've spent a good deal of this second year of my presidency tangling with open access issues, particularly in the context of Plan S. What I've been most engaged with is not the principle of open access per se, nothing innately wrong with that, but the unintended consequences for the social sciences and humanities of a model primarily designed for STEM. The ESA response to the consultation on Plan S made it clear that there are important concerns about the charging of APCs for open access journals, discriminating in favor of those with research grants rather than those without, or who are in wealthier universities and wealthier countries at the expense of those who are not, or who are in precarious or transitional positions. There are also serious issues with the type of license agreement which is being demanded, which means that our work can be reused for profit. And there will be a midday special session which will go into much more detail about those issues. However, it is critical, crucial, that we engage with open access in our publishing portfolio as the ESA. And now is definitely the moment to do so. In this context, and because our current publishing contract ends at the end of 2020, we held a formal tender process to publish the ESA's journals, European Societies, and the European Journal of Cultural and Political Sociology. This involved taking advice from outside consultants on the process of tendering and contracts, and also from an academic expert on open access. I'm delighted to announce that the panel made a unanimous decision that the winning application came from Bristol University Press. They are a not-for-profit press and share the ESA's values. Um, I have personally published with a number of UK-based presses and currently have a book series with BUP, so have personal comparative experience and have been very impressed with their commitment to both sociology and to quality. We are currently working with Bristol University Press to establish a completely new open access journal to be named Open Sociology, which will be hosted on a new platform and will enable many creative possibilities for sociology publishing with very low APCs for ESA members. This, this is obviously still in development, but we will be seeking to establish an editorial board and hope to begin to accept papers during 2020 for a 2021 launch. So I very much hope that many of you will start to think about writing for this journal. This conference has been supported in many different ways by many people, and I would like to take a moment to thank them now. I really hope I don't forget anyone, but my apologies in advance if I do. To the city of Manchester for a very generous subvention, and particularly to Anthony Cassidy at Marketing Manchester for negotiating this on our behalf. We have for the first time other sponsors for this conference, and special thanks are due to the publishers Taylor and Francis for sponsoring this opening ceremony. I would also like to thank Cambridge University Press and Bristol University Press for their generous support with pens and, the, and water bottles that are in your conference bags. The, po the Policy and Evaluation Research Unit at Manchester Metropolitan University have supported the filming of some of the events. And the School of Social Sciences at the University of Manchester hosted a reception that some of you might have attended earlier this afternoon. 
Particularly grateful thanks are due to Professor Gary Pollock and all the members of the local organising committee, without whom this conference in Manchester would not have been possible. Also to the team at the Man Manchester Convention Bureau for their, their help with information about the city. Enormous thanks to members of the ESA Conference Committee and Executive, and most especially to the office team, Dagmar Danko, Andrea Batista Diaz, and also to Giovanni Verducci and Sophia Julien, here on the front row, wave to people. Um, they've all been working very hard in the run-up to the conference, but Dagmar Danko has been working on this conference since December 2007, and its success is very much down to her careful and creative work. Thanks, thanks are also due to the, the absolutely excellent events teams at Manchester Metropolitan and the University of Manchester, and also to the staff here at the Bridgewater Hall. And finally, thanks to you for coming to shape what I very much hope will be a great conference, and you, of course, are at the heart of that conference. We've tried to take account of the environment and to avoid the use of plastic, but there's still much we can learn in this regard. We hope, though, that, that the, despite inevitable failings, that this conference will feel friendly and inclusive and that you will have a really good time, both intellectually and socially. I'm going to finish in a slightly unorthodox way by reading a poem, not one of my own, you'll be relieved to hear, or some of you will be relieved to hear. Lem Sisse is a renowned poet and playwright and an advocate particularly for children in the care system. He also happens to be the Chancellor of the University of Manchester. He would have liked to be here with us to read himself, but unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. Lem was born in Britain to an Ethiopian mother and then taken into care, not meeting his birth mother again until he was 21. And that has to some extent shaped his life. But this poem was written for the University of Manchester and speaks to what we do as academics and perhaps especially as sociologists. And I'm sure that we will discuss how to do more of it as this conference progresses. The poem is called Making a Difference and it says in brackets, a poem to be read aloud. We are shaking and waking and breaking indifference. We are quaking and taking and making a difference. We are working, observing, recording, researching, wherein we're conferring, subverting, referring. We're counting the minutes, the moments, the loss, redressing the balance, addressing the cost. We are citing and fighting, it's all in the writing. The spark is igniting, in dark we are lightning. We are breaking the brackets. The fact is the planet's in rackets and rackets of rackets in brackets. The systems, the victims, the damning, the scamming, the bias predicting, the beating and banning, the skills we exchange, the breaking of chains, the actions sustained, the makers of change. To relentless senses, the damned and defenseless, our words are the action, the louder reaction. When no one is listening, we hear. When heads turn away, we volunteer. We work, we stand tall, we rise up to be counted. We climb mountains. We are shaking and waking and breaking indifference. We are quaking and taking and making a difference. It now gives me great pleasure to invite the Lord Mayor of the City of Manchester, Council Abdid Latif Shoan, to address us. Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to welcome you all here for the 14th Conference of the European Socialistic Association and to welcome you all to the, this unique surroundings of the Bridgewater Hall. Manchester has a proud history. 
You can see the image of a bee all over Manchester. It is a worker bee, symbolizing Manchester's history of hard work and its place as the first industrial city. Over 19th century textile mills were known as havers of the activities which their workers compared to bees. Master is still full of hardworking people, but it has been changed a lot over the years, and it is an excellent choice for a conference. We are a diverse city, multicultural, multi-ethnic, promoting tolerance and understanding. Master is the regional capital of the Northwest with an ever-growing international profile. A modern city with excellence in health, science, commerce, education, finance, culture, and sport. I am sure that you have a very busy agenda set out for you during your time here in Manchester. But I do hope you will have a little free time to explore and enjoy all that Manchester has to offer. You are in charge of the warmest Minkunian of welcome here. Enjoy your conference and most of all, enjoy Manchester. Thank you very much. Okay, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Malcolm Cross, the Vice Chancellor of Manchester Metropolitan University, who will say a few words of welcome. Well, thank you very much indeed. Can you hear me okay at the back? Great, good. So, I'm not um, unaccustomed to speaking here at the Bridgewater Hall because Manchester Metropolitan University um, uses this venue for our graduation ceremonies and this year we um, conferred degrees on over 10,000 students who passed across the platform here. We had 23 ceremonies. I didn't expect to be back quite so soon but it is really great to be here so uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. When um, Gary Pollock said to you, would you address the ESA, I said I'd be absolutely delighted. I've been to many ESA conferences and spoke on a number of occasions. Some of you may be thinking, well, we've never heard of him, so um, how come he's been to so many ESA conferences? But in my world, as an ecologist, the ESA is the Ecological Society of America. <laughs> and so your namesake is currently enjoying a conference of four to 5,000 people in Kentucky in the US. Uh, and interestingly, they may well be discussing things that are not dissimilar to some of the topics that you will address throughout the course of this week. And I think what is interesting today is the importance of coming together across disciplinary boundaries to address some of the grand challenges that we face as a society. And as somebody who is interested in climate change and the impacts of humans on the planet and population growth, and all the challenges that come from that, I'm sure that looking at those issues through a sociology lens, you will have important perspectives to offer. And I think the more that we can elide those perspectives with the way in which other disciplines view these challenges, the better we'll be as a cohesive society to address them and to come up with sustainable solutions. So I think the work that you do in that regard is really important. And I'll be very interested, I think, to look and see what the conclusions are from this conference and compare them with the outcomes from my own subject colleagues discussing matters in uh, the US at this very same period in time. Um, it's impossible for a university vice-chancellor to stand up and speak without saying something about what, what makes their university strong and distinctive and different. So in thinking about doing this, um, I can give you one example of something that Manchester Metropolitan University does, which is better than all these universities put together. If you look at the University of Oxford, Cambridge, University College London, King
King's College London, Imperial College London, and the LSE, what does my university, what does Gary's university do more of than all those other universities put together? We educate more students from the lowest privileged backgrounds, the most disadvantaged students in the UK, over 11,000 of them, than all those institutions put together. So if you're thinking about social change and the way in which we can create opportunities and mobility in society, it's universities like Manchester Met that have a fundamental role to play. Now, I don't want to go away thinking that we are a university for the underprivileged or the disadvantaged because that's only part of what we do. We're not a research intensive university, but the areas where we do have research strengths, I believe are second to none. And it was apposite that Sue read a poem, because poetry is really big here in Manchester. The great University of Manchester has Lem Sisse as its chancellor, and we have the recently retired poet laureate, Professor Dame Caroline Duffy, as the creative director of our School of Creative Writing. And if there's one thing that we do, which we believe is um, second to none in the UK, it's teach students to write creatively and to produce poetry which is world class and world leading. So poetry is a really big thing here in Manchester. I was really pleased Sue, to hear you use that poem as a beautiful way of um, representing this conference. Our other areas of research strength um, sit in education. We have a fantastically strong um, outfit that looks at um, education and particularly focusing on young people and early years. We um, have a very strong um, group um, in sociology, which uh, Gary and others are part of, particularly fo focusing on social policy and evaluating evidence and looking at how that can be used to drive social change. And we also have great research strengths in sport, health and biosciences. And we work in collaboration with other institutions in Manchester. As the Lord Mayor said, one of the things that defines this city is the fact that we work together. I've worked in uh, many other cities, London, Sheffield, Birmingham in the UK. I've never worked in a city where the universities sit side by side and support one, support one another and see there being a common good and a common purpose in working together across educational boundaries. Because what we do need to do more, I think, is to think about education as an ecosystem, not just individual institutions, but how we can work together. And I think that bringing together a group of people who have a deep interest in sociology is an important way of thinking how we can transcend some of those traditional boundaries and think about what really matters to people and what really matters to society. If we look at what's going on in the world, I'm not going to talk about politics, um, it does feel more fractured, it does feel more, more divided and it does feel more uneven. And ultimately, uh, that is not the way in which society advances and which humans progress. So I applaud the work that you do. Um, I wish you well throughout this week. Look forward to hearing the outcomes. And if you ever fancy a different sort of ESA, try the Ecological Society of America one day. Thank you very much indeed. And now Professor Colette Fagan, who is Vice President for Research at the University of Manchester and who is herself a sociologist, is going to speak to us. Thank you, Sue. Welcome, everybody. On behalf of the University of Manchester, I'm delighted that you're here for the 14th Conference of the European Sociological Association. And I am pleased that we are demonstrating what my colleagues have talked about in terms of the three universities in Manchester and Salford collaborating to organise this event and to bring you to our great city, of which we are very proud. The impressive conference programme and other events will provoke and inspire you as you present your papers, listen to others and discuss your research and ideas. As a sociologist myself, I think Manchester and the wider Greater Manchester region is a particularly appropriate setting for this conference. 
and I hope you will have the opportunity to explore and experience some of it while you are here through your sociological lens. So let me tell you a little bit about Manchester's history to illustrate why it is such a fitting place for sociologists. Manchester was the first industrial city and it has a long tradition of radical ideas, progressive social movements and inventions. As Sue mentioned, this month the centenary of the 1819 Battle of Peterloo is being marked by events across the city, which I hope you'll be able to sample. They're just up the road, two minutes walk. Reporting on what happened that day led to the creation of The Guardian, a major independent newspaper and a leading international voice for informed journalism. Manchester is where the UK's trade union confederation, the TUC, held its first meeting in 1868 and where it celebrated its 150th anniversary. Marx and Engels wrote the conditions of the working class here and Manchester was the home of the Pankhursts and the suffragette movement. Other examples of radical ideas and initiatives rooted in Greater Manchester, which will be one of the areas some of you are engaging in, are the origins of a workers' cooperative movement that started in Rochdale and the vegetarian movement, which started in Altrincham. Early philanthropic industrialists, many of them Quakers and Methodists, built the first public library in the UK, funded public parks and museums, and established my university, the University of Manchester, in 1824 as the first civic university in the UK. So as you walk around, you will see this history, evident in our buildings, our galleries, our museums, our other cultural forums. And you will encounter a diverse and multicultural city region. Over 150 languages are spoken in Greater Manchester. And you will also encounter a city shaped by the inequalities which light the heart of much of our sociological inquiry. My university is proud of its contribution to the city, its past, its present, and we hope its future. To name just a few of our science contributions, this is where Rutherford split the atom, where Turing contributed to the world's first programmable computer, where Lovell built the renowned telescope at Jodrell Bank, and more recently, where graphene was invented. But our social science contribution is equally impressive. In 1948, the university appointed Britain's first black professor, Arthur Lewis, whose seminal work on development and economics was recognized with a 1979 Nobel Prize jointly with Theodore Schultz. Many of our graduates, our social science graduates, have made significant historical and contemporary contributions to advance democratic rights and living standards. They include the suffragette Christabel Pankhurst and Ellen Wilkinson, the feminist and subsequent Minister of Education, the first woman to hold this role, who introduced universal free education with the 1944 Education Act. And today, over 200 of our academics and research students, predominantly drawn from social sciences, are engaged in research to tackle different aspects of global inequalities. And this is one of five major areas of research which we highlight at Manchester as one of our five research beacons on the criteria of internationally recognized research excellence, interdisciplinary collaborations, and scale of activity. Furthermore, our social scientists play a leading role in our efforts to inform local, national and international policy debates through our Policy at Manchester platform, which you may have already visited at the Exhibition Forum. The university has grown with its history. Today we have over 40,000 students, more students on campus, more international, and working with MMU, many more in educationally disadvantaged students than any other UK university. We have approximately 6,500 academic and research staff, and the quality and impact of our research and innovation and our commitment to social responsibility and public engagement is globally recognised through various rankings and international league tables I won't mention here. 
Our research strengths include our large sociology department. Hello, my department. The department has more than 70 academics and research staff, and it's consistently ranked as one of the top sociology departments in the UK for the quality of its research, according to the UK's regular audits, research excellence framework, and so forth. Our three universities continue our tradition of civic engagement. We work closely together and we work closely with local city leaders, businesses, charities and our communities to contribute to the social, economic, cultural and environmental well-being of our region. We've helped to shape our city and we continue to do so as it continues its radical and progressive tradition through new devolved political machinery this includes the UK's only integrated health and social care budget, which is already delivering innovation and services and improvements in health and well-being in a city that encompasses some of the very poorest communities in the UK. And a mayor who is driving a progressive change agenda through an inclusive industrial strategy designed to reduce inequalities and with a carbon reduction commitment, which is more ambitious than our national government. So, in all that background, to have 3,000 sociologists from across Europe and further afield gathered here is a fantastic event, fantastic opportunity for our universities, our city, and I hope for you all. So let me briefly reflect on the kind of questions I think we need to address as sociologists and social scientists more generally. When I trained in the 80s and 90s, Globalisation and convergence were the dominant preoccupations in my field. In development studies as an undergraduate, as a doctoral student in sociology, and then working in interdisciplinary teams on working conditions um, and inequalities in Europe. Now we're in a quite different context now. Those debates will still run, but we have to deal with new challenges. As others on the panel have already mentioned, too many build borders are being built or are hardening in Europe, in America, and in every content, continent. Even international cooperation in Antarctica and in space exploration is under strain. Furthermore, we're in an era of climate emergency, populist politics accompanied by fake news tactics, rising xenophobia, and attacks on democratic rights widening economic inequalities and a growing global economic elite disconnected from its place and origin, persistent social divisions such as by gender, ethnicity, religion and disability, aging populations, an asylum and refugee crisis of enormous scale caused by political, economic and environmental disruptions, and on top of that, the disruptions and opportunities afforded by artificial intelligence and the digital era. So to address these and many other questions which preoccupy us, as sociologists and social scientists, whatever we call ourselves, we need to continue to develop new research methods and refine our established ones. We are grappling with new types of data and new ethical issues associated with the digital era, and we increasingly find ourselves working in interdisciplinary teams with the challenges and the rewards which that can bring. I am confident that sociologists and our wider community of social science and humanities will continue to address important questions, to advance theory and to innovate in our methods and data collection. This is evident in the scope of the conference programme ahead of you. More than ever, I would leave you with a suggestion that we need to ask difficult and important research questions. We need to research with rigour. We need to think creatively and critically. We need to communicate in a concise and clear language to reach a wide audience. And let's be honest, sociologists have not always been that good with their jargon, so we need to start stripping some of that back. And we need to offer conclusions and recommendations based on what we have learned. More broadly, in many societies, including the UK, we are currently in an environment where we have to demonstrate the civic value of scholarship and universities. Not just in terms of economic gains for society or graduate earnings for our students, 
but through testimony about the transformative effect of education on our lives, through sharing and discussing our ideas and discoveries with all parts of society, and through remaining independent while also collaborating and co-producing with policymakers, businesses and charities where this is appropriate for the particular research project we are engaged in. So, let me conclude. I wish you a fabulous and exciting conference, a time to connect with colleagues, to re-energise in our difficult international political times, and to enjoy your sociological encounter with our city. Thank you. And now, last but absolutely by no means least, Professor Gary Pollock, the chair of our local organising committee. The first uh, international conference that I attended was the uh, ESA conference in Budapest in 1995. I came away from that conference feeling inspired, excited, lots of ideas. I went to, I have been to, almost every ESA conference since then, and it never fails to inspire me and excite me. It's taken me around all sorts of different cities in Europe. Uh, I've met all sorts of interesting people and heard all sorts of lovely presentations and taken that away and um, often tried to do something with it myself. I've often felt that it, is, it should, should be important for Manchester to be able to host the ESA. And I'm really pleased that um, after a few years of trying that we've managed to get it here. So I'd really like to thank the ESA office in Paris for uh, being interested in us having the conference in Manchester. The most recent conference, of course, was held in Athens. And um, you may, for those of you who were there, you may recall that the closing plenary in uh, Athens was, um, uh, included Hartmut Rosa. And he was, ex ex uh, he was uh, presenting on his uh, latest book, Resonance, which is now uh, available in English. So I think it's uh, quite appropriate that we are now sitting in a hall which normally resonates with the music of the Halle Orchestra of Manchester. Sadly, you won't be able to hear them play because we're using their facilities for the duration of the conference. Okay, we need to move swiftly towards the uh, plenary, so I'd just like to give a few thanks. Sue's already given some thanks, um, but uh, there has to be some from me as well. Uh, thank you very much to the ESA office for their support in um, helping us arrange this conference. They're a fantastic team. They're a small team, but gosh, they work hard. I'd like to thank my local organizing committee. This is a coming together of uh, staff from the University of Manchester, the University of Salford, and my own Manchester Metropolitan University. They're a fantastic bunch. Their names are all listed in the program. Read their names, see what they do, find out what they're writing about. You know, I, I, I can guarantee you, you will be uh, reading very interesting, uh, thought-inspiring work. They've been uh, really uh, good to work with. Everything that goes well about the conference is due to them, and any glitches will be due to me. Finally, I'd like to thank our volunteers. We've got a small army of student volunteers helping us with all sorts of aspects of the conference. Many of you will have already seen them in their yellow t-shirts with Ask Me written on the back. They are tomorrow's sociologists. They are brilliant. They are really helpful. Um, do stop, say hello to them, and uh, uh, I'd like to actually, I'd like for us all to give a round of applause here now for our volunteers. Okay, that's it from me. So I think what we need to do now is we need to um, move towards the plenaries for this evening. So I should like to hand the microphone back to Sue, uh, who will invite the plenary speakers to the stage. Thank you.
Okay. You can stop you can stop talking to each other now. Thank you. I was I was actually thinking about setting you all a, a challenge to talk to ten people every day of the conference that you've never spoken to before. I've got no way of testing whether you've done it, of course, but it's quite a nice idea. Okay, we're now we're now gonna move into plenary mode. As you know, we have three plenaries at the conference. This is the first one, it's very exciting. We've got six wonderful speakers. Um, but we, in order to have six wonderful speakers, it means we don't have terribly much time and we need to allow them to speak. So we've made a decision that there won't be questions. We will listen to the speakers and then we'll go to the reception and we can talk about what they've said and we can talk to them if we want to we would only have time maybe for one and a half questions or something, so better not to get into that. Okay, so first it, it gives me huge pleasure to introduce Professor Michel Vivorcher from the École des Hautes Etudes in Science Sociale, and he is also the director of FMSH in Paris, which is the home of the European Sociological Association. So Michel is a great friend to the ESA, and it's it's, I mean, I, I, I've had many conversations with him over my two years as president, but it's wonderful to have the opportunity to actually hear him develop his, his ideas under the title of Democracy, Populism and After. Michelle. Good evening, everybody. It's very impressive when you are here, I can tell you. I would like, first of all, to thank you and also all those that participate in the organization of this superb conference and those that participated in my invite, invitation tonight. It is a great honor for me. And I must say, it's a great honor to be in Manchester. What we have been said a few minutes ago is very, very important. We are also, as everybody knows, in a very specific historical moment for this country, at a moment when UK is preparing Brexit, and we cannot discuss without having this in our mind, I, unfortunately. I will start with this. The vote for Brexit means several things, of course. It has been an expression of social issues like in many other countries. In this country, like in other countries, lots of people that belong to popular classes or to low middle classes have the feeling, or had the feeling, not to exist, to be forgotten, to be invisible. In my country, the leader of the National Front, Marine Le Pen, likes to speak about the oublié et invisible forgotten and invisible people. You have many people like that that voted for Brexit, like others that voted for Trump, like others that voted extreme right in Italy, that voted for Bolsonaro in Brazil, and so on. So it's not a unique phenomenon, but this case here leads to, lead, led to uh, this terrible uh, decision, uh, and, and this is a social issue, first of all. It is also a mixture, from my point of view, of political and media logics. On the one hand, we must recognize that Brexit is a democratic choice. People voted. I have not heard about any important dirty tricks as far as the process of vote itself was at stake. That's for the politics. But on the other hand, as it was not far from being said just a few minutes ago, it has been the result of fake news. We are living in a post-truth era, and those expressions, fake news, post-truth, became successful in the whole world due to two phenomena: Trump on the one hand, and Brexit on the other hand. So democratic votes, and fake news. And as you may know, fake news 
and uh, post-truth became the word of the year in two important dictionaries, the Oxford and the Collins, just after Brexit and Trump's uh, election. So this is an aspect of what I want to say tonight. People voted, so democracy was not a problem as such. But today, we all know that democracy is no longer a non-contested, a fully successful idea. We cannot accept, if we never did, the arrogant and optimistic statement by Fukuyama in 1989 when he said that we were entering the end of history, explaining that from his point of view there was no alternative to market and democracy after the collapse of the Soviet empire. We cannot accept this statement. So I would like to start by suggesting a non-exhaustive list of challenges that make the famous Fukuyama's affirmation unacceptable today. First of all, democracy is not so well able to deal with economic issues such as unemployment, rising inequalities, precarity. We sociologists, we know that quite well. In a global world, neoliberalism does not accept economic boundaries and barriers as far as they deal with goods and money. But it is not true with human beings, migrants, asylum seekers. And we all know that these issues are stronger and stronger, including in democracies. A second point, which was raised also a little bit before, is that democracy is not perfectly equipped in order to face cultural differences. I like the poem that you have read. Sometimes these differences are connected with a territory and a minority population is asking for independence. Recently, in Europe, Scotland and Catalonia. The Scottish case, from my point of view, maybe some people would not agree with me, but the Scottish case, until now, was solved democratically under Cameron. This is true. But if you look at Catalonia and Spain, we are far from having a solved issue. It's a huge problem. And if there is no a, a problem with territory, we also have in many countries, in most countries today, debates and problems with cultural diversity, minorities, communities. And it is not so easy to propose real satisfying solutions. Of course, we all know the ID, which is called multiculturalism, affirmative action, which is not cultural but social. We also have heard sometime of the idea of cultural rights, but all these issues are, all these solutions are not so easy to implement, and there is a lot of serious reasons to discuss and criticize them. That is to say, democracy does not bring just like that the answer to this issue of cultural differences. A third point that we all know since Montesquieu is connected with the idea of separation of powers. Yes, it's a wonderful idea which has something to do with democracy. But today, in our world, when there is an important threat, whatever it be, a real one or an imagined threat, when terrorism is at stake, for instance, the executive power always acts in order to abolish or at least to weaken this principle. And first of all, to weaken the judicial power. They act for non-democratic device in order, they say, to protect democracy, which is very paradoxical. This is the case in my country, in France. I could give some more precise example. This is a case, of course, in the United States with the famous Patri Patriot Act after 9-11. Uh, in times of high demands for security, those who try to protest and say that there is a problem with the separation of powers are 
usually considered as bad guys. Let me add that we social scientists are frequently among these bad guys that protest when democracy on this aspect is at stake. A fourth point is that democracy can offer opportunities for the enemies of democracy when extreme right people are regularly and democratically elected, and this is not new, this is a real problem. Some people like to recall Hitler, but here I want to just to say something which is very important. We should never forget that Hitler used both elections and violence to get access to power. So when in a country we have at the same time elections with extreme right and lots of violence, we must be aware that important phenomena are at stake. So there is a real challenge today because extremist, extremist forces that are elected democratically and in most cases without violence get access to power and become closer and closer to the power or become, become closer and closer to the, power, to the power through clean elections. My last point here is that democracy is useful when conflicting or contradictory demands or interests are at stake. But today, in many countries, conflictuality leads to fragmentation and not to institutionalization and political treatment of the problem through debate and negotiation. There is, as everybody knows, a global crisis of liberal democracy, that is to say, a crisis in our political and institutional systems and in the capacity of representation. This crisis, which is a political crisis, has a lot to do with social transformations. In the past, there were some connections between the social and the political representations. I will simplify a lot. We can say that in the past, in many countries, the left was in charge of workers' interests and demands, and the right of order and economic realism. But today, this does not work anymore. We are, even in Manchester, the famous city, industrial city, we are no longer in industrial societies. But we also miss those new social or cultural actors that would be strong enough to provide resources to political projects or programs. We miss them. I don't say that they don't exist, but they are, from my point of view, too weak. And in such a situation, some social scientists will speak of post-democracy, Colin Crouch. I would like also to quote a, a wonderful uh, Russian sociologist who died 10 years ago, Yuri Levada, maybe some of you have known this person. He used to speak of contemplative democracy. I like this expression. That is to say, political abstention, promotion of direct democracy, uh, maybe, but generally speaking, without having a strong interest for political life and, and debates. So, of course, there are some solutions. Some people say we should implement more participative democracy, more deliberative democracy. I don't enter in these dis discussions, of course. And this started at least 30 or 40 years ago with very important uh, debates, including people like uh, Jürgen Habermas. But this is not enough to solve these problems. As I said, globalization and neoliberalism have a large responsibility in this evolution. But there is one consequence which is nevertheless not negative. These evolutions also open a new space for democracy, open new frontiers for democracy. In the classical thinking, democracy is at its best at the state and national levels. But today, on the one hand, new expressions of democracy go beyond the nation 
state level and others go under the same level. There are some extensions of democracy, for instance, in the international life, with, for instance, international rules, law, institutions. 50 years ago, the UN was not protecting so many NGOs, which are so important in democratic global uh, life. So at the level which is above the nation state, we can say that there are some hopes to see more democracy. And at the other extremity of the spectrum, there is more democracy uh, under this level. Let me give a few examples. For instance, today it is no longer possible in institutions where it was possible in the past to say that there is no dirty problems, dirty behaviors, to protect those people that uh, make uh, pedophilia, that are violent with women, and so on. Today, institutions cannot protect, as in the past, violence, hatred, and a certain number of behaviors. Let us just have a look with uh, what happens in many churches, L have a look what happens in the in the uh, in jails, uh, what happens in in the including in the military, where today a, a soldier can say, "I don't want to obey. This is not uh, possible for me," which was absolutely forbidden uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. This is also true with the school system. A pupil today is a subject, and not only uh, an object for educators. This is true also, not in all families, unfortunately, but in some families. Families become more democratic, some families at least. In the past, in a family, the father was the, the king, and there was no room for children and for the wife. Today, this has, is changing. I don't, I'm not an expert in family sociology, but things are changing also. And I want to finish on, for this point, saying that the city, is more and more frequently considered as a key place for democracy, including for democracy at the global level, but organized through the city. I just want to recall the name of Ulrich Beck, who died a, a few years ago. His posthumous, his posthumous book on the metamorphosis of the world strongly supported this idea of a key role of cities in a democratic life. This leads me to the second part of this talk. In such a world, in such situations, the democratic idea or the democratic spirit or the democratic ideal is challenged, as I try to show, for strong sociological reasons. It does not bring what it should bring, full employment, satisfying answers to cultural demands, and so on. So what happens? Some people ask for authoritarian solutions. Other people explain that democracy is a Western principle without universal value, and that other regimes can propose much better formulas. So the question, from my point of view, should be, is democracy equipped in order to conciliate at least two exigencies? On the one hand, promote the unity of a society, and on the other hand, deal with its diversity and treat social, cultural, religious differences. Some people don't believe that liberal democracy is able to bring a solution to this dilemma. And some people will say the only important point today will be unity. So let us find a principle of unity. And those people will, for instance, choose the nation as a principle of unity. Other people will ask, as I said, for most authority, a, milit a military dictatorship, for instance. But the main phenomenon today, at this stage, is what I will call neo-populism. I say neo-populism in order to introduce a distinction between what we could call classical populism and the new aspects of this phenomenon. 
There is an history of classical populism. If you have an interest for this notion of populism, you will find a lot of books and articles proposing more or less the same history. It begins with the Russian Narodniki, that is to say, these young students and uh, intellectuals that were leaving the city in Russia in order to go to the people at the end of the 19th century. Then the history of populism includes the American farmers of the People's Party, end of the 19th century too. Then the history of populism includes the analysis of Latin American regimes, such as Perón's uh, in Argentina. But this is some kind of populism. Today, we have a new phenomenon that started in the 80s, 30 years, 40 years ago maybe, that became stronger and stronger in the 90s. And today, in many European countries, and not only, we have been in confronted with the inc strong increase of this new phenomenon that I try to call neo-populism, to introduce a distinction with those older uh, phenomena. So, this phenomena is everywhere in Europe, in the western part of Europe, but also in the former Soviet Empire, and we have to analyze it and to understand what is at stake and also to describe what is at stake. So, <coughs> in uh, some cases, it is more easy to understand, and this helps to understand not only these cases, but other cases. I just would like to say a few words about the Polish case, which I have been working on in, in, in the past. There was a very important historian and activist in Poland whose name was Karol Modzelewski. Some of you know his name. Karol Modzelewski, who died a few weeks ago, and he published a biography. I don't know the English title of the biography, in French, it's a very strange, uh, strange title. Nous avons fait galoper l'histoire. We made history, we made a ride, a very uh, rapid ride with history. And he explains, in this book, it's a very important book, a very big book, and he, he explains in this book something which is very, very important. He says, with solidarity in 1980 and 1981, we were so many people all together believing in ideas of progress, in ideas of solidarity, in ideas of uh, 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 having an, putting an end to the Soviet regime and, and so on. It was a wonderful moment. But then came the 90s. And then things changed a lot on this side, on the side of solidarity. And his explanations, this is what I want to insist on, is to say, at that moment, many people said, on the side of solidarity, we must finish with the Soviet economy. We must pass to some totally different economy. So these people were not so far from the discourse of the right. They were from the left, to say it like that, but they were using the same categories. We must clean the country, we must finish with this economy uh, which, is, which cannot work anymore. And so, what happened is that all this group, this community of people that belong to Solidarity, was divided into two pieces. On the one hand, those that wanted to join the general tendency to clean the country, which introduced no difference between them and more rightist people, and the other one that became radical, that were radicalized. There was no more, to say it like that, this general central element that was making solidarity. And I think that this kind of explanation is very important if we want to understand what happened, at least on the left, in many countries. No more space for classical left, some of the people join the right in order to introduce neoliberalism and, and uh, therapy, economic therapy and these kind of things, and other people became radicalized. So, in this context, I think that <coughs> the historical change led 
to the collapse of the classical left, there were also collapse of the classical right. I'm not an expert on this. And this led to a moment when people that had still some interest in politics could not, did not know how to behave politically. If I say that, and I would need much more time to be more precise, is to say that those neo-populism that I try to discuss with you are political phenomenon, answers to this kind of evolution, rooted in deep social, political, and economic transformations. I would like to describe very shortly some of their main characteristics. The first one, which is maybe surprising, these neo-populism in themselves are not violent or in favor of violence. They want to be respectable. They want to win elections. That's my first point. Of course, of course, you will have sometimes violence connected with this phenomenon of neo-populism. But the actors don't like violence. I could give the French example, which is very interesting. The National Front is not in favor of violence. It is not. And uh, for instance, there was a big scandal uh, 25 years ago in a small city in the south of France, Carpentras, where in a Jewish cemetery, many graves have been broken and dirty things done with one cadaver and uh, awful things. Everybody said, this is a national front. The National Front said, no, we are not guilty of this kind of violence. And five or six years after, it was demonstrated that they were not guilty. And I could give other cases that pop, this kind of neo-populism does not like violence. That's my first point. My second point is that this kind of neo-populism are not totally culturally conservative or reactionary. I say it with caution. They can introduce in their discourses quite contradictory um, proposal in, that include a certain opening to very modern cultural aspects of our life. For instance, in the Netherlands, the leader of the main populist uh, party does not say anything against homosexuality. And here, we could introduce some differences between the West and the, the East. In the Western pop, neo-populism, people are more open-minded toward cultural uh, modernity than in the Eastern part of uh, Europe. But I would like to go to the main point when you try to analyze this phenomenon. This phenomenon has never any problem with totally contradictory statements or discourses. They can say something like, we, the people, shall be the same through our transformations. They can be racist, they can be anti-Semitic, but they can also include black people or Jews. They are not necessarily strongly nationalistic, but they include or they can include some nationalism. They used to have a charismatic leader, but this does not mean that they will accept any authoritarian leader, not necessarily. We had a very interesting case in France with the yellow vest, but I have no time to, 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 to discuss this, but it's a very interesting case. So they say that they are anti-systemic, but they want to participate in the system. So if you try to describe the discourse of this forces, you will see that there is a lot of contradiction and that this is not a problem. And this leads me to my main point, which is that the phenomenon that I call neopopulism is a myth, a mythical discourse. That is to say, a, a discourse that conciliates contradictions on an imaginary way when in the reality, the contradictions cannot be conciliated. This is a rather anthropological definition of the myth. It is to say, a discourse 
that has no problem with contradiction because it is a discourse. But this is possible or easy when the populist actors protest as opponents far from any political power or far from any political participation in the power. But when, but when these forces are close to get access to political responsibilities, when they win elections, when they have alliance with other France forces that will make them able to participate in the power, then protesting is not enough. Discourse is not in us. These forces have now to participate in real action. And in this situation, passing from protesting to participating in political power, these four forces usually change, are transformed. Or if they are not transformed, they are a discourse which has less and less capacity to modify reality. It, it is not an an, a, a European example, but the Mexican case today could be analyzed like that. So my question is, what happens when a myth cannot work, when a myth exploded? Of course, many different scenarios are possible. Let us come back to my first example, historical example. The, fir the first populist, as I said, was this Narodniki that wanted to join the people. Some of them, after some years, became terrorists. They tried to kill the Tsar and this kind of thing. Others joined the Social Revolutionary Party. If you look at the American People's Party, when it was not able to exist anymore, some of them decided to join the Democratic Party. Not so bad. But today, what is at stake in Europe is much more worrying. Neo-populism seems to open the way to clearer and stronger nationalism, extremism, to authoritarian tendencies, much more than those that were included, contained, embedded in the populism. And it may also, and this is not the same, favor tendencies towards violence because it's the end of the populist moment. I could take the French case as an example with the yellow vest. They, become, they began very peacefully and with strong populist dimensions. And at the very end of the process, the more they lose their capacity to act and the more some of them some of them will say, OK, let us act violently. So my point is, neo-populism is not the worst. Neo-populism is not the end of political processes. Neo-populism is a moment, and what we have to understand is what is going to happen after neo-populism, when it cannot work, either because it is becoming weak, either because it is becoming too strong and close to the political power, it ex the meat exploded. And the worst tendencies may have a strong chance to be uh, stronger. And we have to analyze these kind of issues. So this leads me to my conclusion. I hope I was not too, too long. Democracy, as I said, has to combine answers to two exigencies protecting the unity of the society and organizing the political treatment of its diversity. If you promote only unity or only diversity, you will have big problems. So, if what happens is that populism provides a mythical answer to this challenge because populism is proposing an image of the unity, and also is protesting when it appears. But there is a moment when the protest does not work anymore, things are changing, and at that moment, big dangers are arising. I will finish with the Italian case, because it's a very clear example of what I'm trying to say. Until recently, 
you had an alliance between the extreme right, La Lega, and the populism, Cinque Stelle, five stars. What happens is that when this alliance is at, the, at power, it happens that the mythical five stars cannot be as strong as the nationalist, extremist, authoritarian, extreme right. And that the populist is mm, losing every day its importance, and that the extreme uh, dimensions of the political uh, forces in this country are more and more important. So my point, I hope I was clear, is that the general evolution towards populism, or what I call neo-populism, is not the end. The end can be worse. It can be also not so bad, but today I don't feel so optimistic. This was my, what I wanted to tell you, and this is why I think we, social scientists, sociologists, have to work on these issues as to understand how people built mythical answers to their problem in some historical situation and how these mythical answers can be transformed into worse situation because uh, of not uh, because of uh, the lack of other answers in our societies thank you for your patience Thank you, Michelle, for sharing your wisdom with us and for those, those careful ideas that I'm sure we'll want to continue to discuss throughout the conference. And I suspect you'll have a queue of people wanting to talk to you while you're having your glass of wine afterwards. But now it, it gives me equal pleasure to introduce P P Professor Manuela Boac from the Institute of Sociology at the University of Freiburg in Germany. And Manuela is um, going to speak to the title Europe Otherwise on Decolonialization, Creolization, and Interimperiality. And I had the pleasure of sitting with Manuela at dinner last night, and my head was buzzing with new thoughts and ideas just from that brief encounter. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing them elaborated now, and I'm sure you will be fascinated as well. Manuela. Well, that puts some pressure. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. I am very excited to be here, and I am very grateful for the invitation and for the opportunity to speak to you. I am excited about being here, especially because the topic of the conference, Europe and Beyond, Boundaries, Barriers, and Belonging, is closely tied not only to my current research interests, but um, particularly to my epistemic and intellectual positioning. Um, as a Romanian who migrated to Germany some 25 years ago to study sociology, there was a deep conflict between what I thought Europe was and what it was turning out to be before my eyes. I had been raised to consider myself European, and I had also been um, raised to not have to think about whether or not I was white in 80s Romania in the capital. Now, migrating to Germany in the years preceding the so-called Eastern enlargement of the European Union meant that I witnessed Europeanness being gradually narrowed down to European Union citizenship, and also the whiteness of Europe's Easterners and Southerners being increasingly questioned on top of the questioning of belonging of the others of Europe within. So this border between the West and the East of Europe is the place I am speaking from, epistemically and politically, and this is the border between the west of Europe and one of its other Europes. But while dealing with these differences in my research, 
I was realizing that the eastern border of Europe is not the only border that should matter and that I should not be complicit in invisibilizing other borders while thinking precisely about this one. So that's where the title of my talk comes from, Europe Otherwise, it echoes that another way of thinking is possible and that is part of the self-critique. But it's of course the uh, principle behind the World Social Forum, right? Another world, another thinking is possible. So I am trying to think about worlds and knowledges otherwise in response to both coloniality and inter-imperiality by starting from the subject position of what I think is most sociology, Europe in quotation marks, or Europe in theory. Now, Europe in theory is not only the title of a great book by Roberto Dainotto, uh, published in 2012, um, whose cover, as you can see, foregrounds both the importance of Christianity and of whiteness for a self-definition of Europe. Europe in theory is also part of the legacy of social theory which has long operated with a sanitized and sublimated version of European history. What do I mean by sanitized? To put it very briefly, the Europe constituting the subject matter as well as the subject position of most sociological theory increasingly ignored the experience of the East and the South of Europe in the accounts of Europe's trajectory towards modernity, nation state formation, and citizenship rights. So there's a minus there, European minus, minus East. This is the reason why Roberto Dainotto wants to rethink Europe from the perspective of the South, or from what in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis was derogatorily called the pigs countries. Right? Now, the prevailing version of European history also largely disregarded the West's colonial and imperial rule and their consequences. Now, many authors, in particular historians, not um, sociologists, have long called attention to the partial character of this notion of Europe, the sanitized one. One of my favorite Bulgarian historian, um, Maria Todorova, has explained how Europe functions as an unmarked category. Depeche Chakrabarty has pointed to how a hyper-real Europe becomes the theoretical subject of all histories, making it necessary to provincialize Europe in order to write adequate history. Others, such as Larry Wolf, have reconstructed the invention of other Europes, in particular Eastern Europe, as a first other within. I'm not going to go through their arguments here, you probably all know them. Instead, I will paraphrase Martinican writer Edouard Glisson, who first drew attention to the fact that the West is not in the West. It is a project, not a place. And I'm trying to argue that the same goes for Europe. Not only is Europe a project rather than a place, it has been a long-term project for a very long time, so it's a work in progress. It's a process, and as such, its result is currently a problem or several. So Europe as a project, a process, and a problem. Now, the approach that I'm proposing here, Europe otherwise, starts from conceiving of Europe as a creolized space by taking into account the regional entanglements derived from European colonialism and imperialism since the 16th century, which is something that um, other people have engaged, when, engaged in, especially with regard to migration and identities. This project, with the very title, Creolizing Europe, has been the object of a co-edited volume published by Manchester University Press, um, Creolizing Europe, Legacies and Transformations, by Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez and Shirley Tate. My own contribution here will um, start from the idea of rethinking Europe from its current colonial borders in South America and the Caribbean, and I'll detail that in a minute. At the same time, this project of creolizing Europe, Europe otherwise, 
is part of the larger undertaking of creolizing theory, which is also something that um, colleagues have engaged um, in, not necessarily from within sociology. A book by that name, The Creolization of Theory, has been co-edited recently by Françoise Lyonnais in Chimé Chou, um, and some of um, our other plenary speakers have chapters in there. So this is a collective project. Again, here, my contribution um, deals with re-inscribing the experiences of people and regions racialized as non-European, non-Western, and or non-white into social theory because these experiences have not been part of what we are accustomed to see as um, prevailing social theory. So but in this regard, the notion or the approach of Europe otherwise can be seen as an instance of what Lyonnais and Xu have called the becoming theory of the minor, or thinking through and with invisibilized peripheral or subaltern formations, or what Quijano or Mignolo have called thinking from coloniality. Making minor formations into method and theory, kind of upending the dominant um, power relation in theory generating. Okay, what is the minor formation here from which to think Europe otherwise? Again, for a long time I was interested in the location assigned to Eastern Europe in the discourse about the European Union as a community of values and in how this type of discourse reflected the hierarchies between multiple and unequal Europes that were re um, resulted from shifts in hegemony between different European colonial powers. And especially I focus around how, around the 18th century, France and England had emerged as uh, self-proclaimed heroic Europe, the producers of modernity's main, revolution, main revolutions, which was a speaker's position that relegated the declining colonial powers, Spain and Portugal, um, to the status of a decadent Europe, decadent from power. And at the same time, the east of Europe to a perpetual catching up with the West, or with what I called epigonal Europe, the epigons um, hopefully constantly trying to catch up. Most useful as illustrations of the revival of such discourse in the 21st century were the official maps of the European Union shortly before the 2004 enlargement round, in which the European continent was literally color-coded to reflect the different speeds of accession of candidate countries, and by extension, these countries' closeness to the European ideal. And here's the first map, um, still available online, European Commission Audiovisual Services. The first map uh, detailing the um, Eastern European enlargement of the um, 2004 round. In yellow were the member states um, until 2004. Blue were the 10 new members, Eastern European states, that joined that year. In purple were Romania and Bulgaria that had been denied access in the 2004 round, and Turkey, which had been a candidate to accession since 1986. After the enlargement happened, the European Commission issued another map, also color-coded, but that reflected the new status. In it, the EU25 was all colored in yellow, while the candidate countries, Romania, Bulgaria, and by now Croatia, were depicted in dark gray. Turkey was in a mid-gray, and the rest of those who never had a hope of becoming candidates or becoming members of the European Union were in light gray. So the gray was kind of um, the bad um, part of Europe. Now, striking in both cases, and striking to me, because for a while I was oblivious to this part of the map, is the representation of Europe's current colonial territories overseas in the upper right corner over there. Seen those? So they are part of a picture. You probably can make them out because they're too small on the map. <laughs> But you, what you're seeing, or should be seeing, are the Azores, Madeira, the Canary Islands, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Réunion, and French Guiana. So they're in the picture, 
but they're not in the discourse. They're depicted in yellow in both maps, just like the full member states, um, but the fact that they are in the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Caribbean, and South America is never part of a discourse of what it means to be European and how geographical Europeanness means or doesn't mean something for their accession. So there seems to be no contradiction. Now, as we all know, the very opposite is the case for Turkey, whose semi-Asian location has repeatedly been um, cited as part of the ground, at least, for denying its membership. So in a hierarchy of what I call multiple and unequal Europes, the EU's overseas territories appear as forgotten Europe. They are missing from Europe's self-representation and the checklist of having been part of modernity's revolutions, but claims are constantly made to them by continental European states. So we know more or less where the south of Europe is, we know more or less where the east of Europe is, but where is forgotten Europe? There's not even a geographic reference for it. And I, want to claim that the lack of a geographic reference is not only linked to the fact that these territories are spread out around the world's ocean, they are a symptom of the coloniality of memory, the systematic omission of enduring colonial ties from public discourse on Europe, as well as the systematic avoidance of any overarching classification of current colonial territories as regions of Europe. And I'm saying this because most references do not happen, references to these territories, do not happen in terms of Europeanness or not. They are references to the history of the states that colonized them. So labels such as Dutch Caribbean, British West Indies, French Antilles have to do with individual states, not with Europe as a whole. So basically, these labels never point to the integral part that colonial possessions have played in the consolidation of European economic and geopolitical power or the present day continuities in Western Europe's entanglement with and policies toward them. Now currently, what I call forgotten Europe's are divided between France and Great Britain, followed by Denmark, the Netherlands, Portugal and Spain, they are administratively part of the European states that colonize them and consequently of the European Union, either as integrated or as associated territories. And an overview of the 34 territories that Europe still colonizes today looks like this. So also very far away for you to see, but just imagine that everything that is dark blue as continental European Union. You see some blue stars over there. These are the territories that are integrated into the European Union. They're part of the common market. Some of them even use the Euro and all of their citizens have European Union nationalities. The ones in yellow are so-called overseas countries and territories. They are not part of the common market. Their citizens mostly do not get to vote in European matters, but they have European Union nationalities and have different uh, sets of votes, it's quite complicated, depending on what state they belong to. So especially the French overseas departments uh, that use the euro uh, as official currency are also represented on euro banknotes, not only in official maps such as the ones that we've seen from the European Union, but also on Euro banknotes, in case you haven't noticed them, you can take out any Euro uh, banknote there on the back. The only one you can really make out is French Guyana because it's big enough um, to see the contours. And the European Central Bank mostly um, does not give a lot of details about why this is the case. Um, at least on the website, the European Central Bank claims um, there are um, also some territories depicted on the Euro banknotes. Um, in which the euro is also used, but there's no kind of reference as to how come that is the case. There is a reference, however, to the territories that are not depicted because they do not have the necessary amount of pixels to be represented. So it's the European Central Bank, they're not sociologists, but um, okay. <laughs> now, 
The interesting part for me um, about this very shaky representation of what Europe is, is that forgotten Europe as an overarching category helps stress the fact that some of the multiple Europes are more unthinkable than others. What I call a pigonal Eastern Europe is white but not quite, Christian but not Western Christian, parts of it are not Western at all, uh, its geographical location in Europe is unquestioned. Now, in terms of the, or in case of the Caribbean territories of the current EU members, it is the African and Asian heritage of their populations, obviously linked to a history of slavery and indenture, that um, basically, together with their non-European um, location, questions their Europeanness, their um, kind of belonging to continental white and Christian Europe. So within forgotten Europe, I think, the Caribbean colonies offer a prime vantage point for upending the dominant understanding and representation of Europe and a concrete basis for a coherent geographic referent if we seem or if we take this to be important. Today, more than one third of Europe's colonies are located in the Caribbean. So um, I think this warrants at least an engagement with what we could call Caribbean Europe, not in order to claim these territories again for Europe, but in order to make them visible as an integral but highly invisibilized part of an otherwise highly visible Europe in theory. And I view Caribbean Europe as encompassing all Caribbean territories previously colonized by a European power and presently administered at, as dependencies of an EU member. That includes both the outermost regions as well as the overseas countries and territories, so they have different uh, statuses here. That means that Caribbean Europe would be just one instance of the multiple Europes that we could make out around the world if we take uh, into account an African Europe with Réunion and Ceuta and Melilla or a Pacific Europe with the British Bitcoin Islands and um, Futuna. Uh, but as the first region in the Americas to be claimed by European powers as early as 1492, the Caribbean has had the longest and long, most long-standing entanglement with Europe. Um, also as the region to have received almost half of the 12.5 million enslaved Africans trafficked in the European slave trade, um, the entanglements in, are not only geographic, political, and economic, but deeply, deeply personal, demographic, and linked to today's migration. Um, in the remaining time, because it's running out, I will try to ask the question, what does Europe look like when this Caribbean component of its history and present is remembered? What does Europe otherwise look like when seen from the Caribbean? And I'll try to briefly discuss three aspects that are different but related, political borders, sovereignty, and Brexit. Quickly, the most immediate effect of thinking of Europe and the European Union as present in the Caribbean is a drastic redrawing of EU borders. The first thing that happens when thinking about where Europe ends is no longer agonizing about where is the east of Europe, where does Asia begin, is Turkey in Europe, are the Urals the eastern border, but rather the one border that is almost never questioned, the Western border. Everyone seems to know the Western border of the European Union and of Europe is the Western coast of Portugal. But if we take colonial possessions of Europe into account and seriously today, Europe's Western border is in French Guiana in South America and in Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. That is not a convenient EU discourse. However, no EU official will contest that this is the case. These are current administrative borders. That also means there is a relocation of EU's external borders. 
Not only does France border Brazil and Suriname in South America, this is also France's longest border. I don't know if this is something taught in schools in France, but this is the case. Also, the Netherlands border Venezuela and the US through the Lesser Antilles, which also include the US Virgin Islands. That also means that we um, have to relocate our understanding, or at least what we teach, or what children are being taught, um, about EU's internal borders, because Caribbean territories are located differently than on the continent, so that means that in the Caribbean, France borders the Netherlands through the islands of Saint Martin, Saint Martin, and also the UK shares a maritime border with the Netherlands, also in the Caribbean. Basically, um, if we teach this as a map, or try to make a map out of this, um, representing Europe's western borders in South America and the Caribbean, we need to shift our focus to zoom out from continental Europe and into the American colonies. That's what a map representing Europe as a single space that goes to the Caribbean and South America could look like. And if used as teaching material, it could help challenge, creolize, not only the student's geographic imaginary, but also their notion of Europe as a historical, political, and economic space. Now, for a long time, mainstream historiography and social science viewed the rise of nation states as the gradual overcoming of multinational political organizations and multi-ethnic empires, um, which led to a conceptualization that empires and nation states were mutually exclusive. You could either have empires or nation states, and that nation states succeeded empires. With the end of empire comes the nation state. And that led to a lot of anomalies and exceptions being produced by this, this rule, including the fact that the existence of the Habsburg, the Ottoman, and the Tsarist empire well into the 20th century were explained away as survivals of the old order, or um, as Frederick Cooper has put it, anachronistic holdovers from an age of aristocracy clinging to their imperial identifications in the face of the inevitable national challenges that mounted over the course of the 19th century. Now, historians have ample evidence for the coexistence of imperial and nation state structures in the 19th and 20th century, but the dominant view is that they no longer coexist in the 21st. Now, state formations such as the European and the US Caribbean territories that are still colonized in the 21st century continue to be viewed as exceptions as remnants, as leftovers of empire, um, and as anomalies in a modern world of sovereign nation states. Now, a growing literature tries to capture the paradoxical logic be behind the functioning of state structures in the non-independent Caribbean using a series of concepts um, such as extended statehood the myth or the paradox of sovereignty, as Lyndon Lewis calls it. Post-colonial sovereignty games, different agencies of state formations, or non-sovereign futures. This is fascinating, but I'm not gonna be able to get into that. The point is, the aim of this entire body of literature, all of it on the Caribbean, is not to foreground the fact that to this day, most of the Caribbean is not independent, but rather that sovereignty, like Europe, is an unmarked category. It is derived from the history of Western Europe, and it can only produce anomalies, exceptions, and deviance when it is superimposed over colonized territories today. It cannot work. Or it cannot work to the benefit of the ones being described with it. So what is important in the context of Caribbean Europe in the 21st century is that its history and present as integral parts of European states and suprastate organizations such as the EU and the British Commonwealth effectively creolize the norm of the sovereign nation state. The non-independent Caribbean encompasses multiple political forms, like we've seen, but also 
tax havens, military bases, privately owned islands, lots of fragmented sovereignties that are mostly not talked about. In his 2005 analysis of um, the transformations undergone by the French state, again, Frederick Cooper was thinking about how do we make sense of France being both an empire and a nation state until late in its history. And he decided that if one wants to rethink France from its colonies, one might argue that France only became a nation state in 1962, when it gave up its attempt to keep Algeria French and tried for a time to define itself as a singular citizenry in a single territory. Now, if we take the Caribbean colonies seriously here, using the same logic, we could say, well, France has not become a nation state to this day. So then what model of the sovereign nation state have political theorists, sociologists, and historians been holding up to newly independent nation states in Asia, Africa, and Latin America? What should you emulate if this never happened? This is underlined especially by new questionings on what the category, uh, what the most adequate category is in terms of analyzing coloniality or anti-imperiality by um, the notion of anti-imperiality of Laura Doyle, who says, you know, we, we continue to make the oddly Eurocentric assumption that Western European imperialism accounts for all recent imperialism with the concomitant misperception that all territory is either a European post-colony or uncolonized. At the same time, we need to take into account that a lot of territories in Europe today are still shaped by the imperial effects and the consequences of the, Ops, the Habsburg, the Ottoman, and the Russian Empire, and that these intersect with coloniality and post-coloniality, so that we basically see parts of Europe legible as inter-imperial if we just question the timeline through which independence of a colony means nation-state formation. Now, last point, uh, in order to make it to what everyone has been talking about today, Brexit, and apply Europe otherwise to it as well. Mm. We are not only taking um, the picture of post-coloniality and inter-imperiality into account when thinking of Europe. We have to think about how debates over borders as well as sovereignty have been at the core of Brexit, not to give a definition of what it is, as if we knew. Just to point out that both EU-level discussions and media discussions of Brexit-imposed borders have tended to revolve around either the Irish border or, at most, Gibraltar. Now, um, we can consider both reasonably colonial borders that have only become highly visible since their ambivalent post-Brexit status threatened to create customs and immigration chaos. At the same time, British overseas territories they're overseas territories, they're associated, they're not integrated, were not given a vote in the referendum, and their impending hard borders have not yet been the object of Brexit negotiations. Now, Britain controls um, 14 overseas territories with different forms of statehood and degree of self-determination in the Caribbean, the West Atlantic, the South Atlantic, the Indian Ocean, the Pacific, and Europe. Gibraltar is the Europe. Yet references to sovereignty during the Brexit negotiations rarely engage these territories, except in the case of Gibraltar, the only one located in Europe and the only full EU member among them. Nor did the negotiations of the rights of British citizens after Brexit consider British people of color and their long-standing experiences with racism and exclusion, as Michaela Benson and Chantelle Lewis have recently shown, thus reinforcing the image of only white Britons in an exclusively white and Christian Europe. On the other side of the Atlantic, Anguilla, the old, oldest British colony and a British territory since 1650, offers a miniature mirror image of Britain's political borders in the Caribbean. Just like Britain, 
Anguilla shares a maritime border with France through its own English channel called the Anguilla Channel. That's the line you see over there. It additionally borders the Netherlands to the south and is dependent upon both for trade and transportation. Planes bound to Anguilla can only land on the Dutch island of Saint Martin, while the only cargo port through which Anguilla receives most goods is located in the French part of the territory, Saint Martin. Anguilla has no access to postal services, fuel, basic medical services, and educational special needs, other than through facilities located on the Dutch and the French territories. The European Union is the island's only source of significant development funds and is currently funding reconstruction projects after Hurricane Irma, which it will no longer receive after Brexit. Tellingly, the government of Anguilla has repeatedly petitioned Theresa May to take Anguilla into consideration in negotiations. They issued several reports, tellingly titled Anguilla and Brexit, Britain's forgotten border in, uh, forgotten EU border, sorry, as well as even Anguilla and Brexit, the solution, offering bilateral agreements for somebody who was not taking them into account and hoping that they would. But before I go further, I'm gonna show a very short clip and hope that it will work. While the impact of Britain's departure from the EU is being felt as far away as the Caribbean, residents of the British Overseas Territory of Anguilla have UK passports, but they weren't allowed to vote in the referendum. Yet their relationship with the European Union is fundamental to their everyday life. Anguilla is 4,000 miles from the UK in the Eastern Caribbean. It depends on the neighboring island of Saint Martin, first just 10 miles across the sea for vital services. But Saint Martin is half French and half Dutch. So will that strong relationship change after Brexit? Nisha Dupi lives in Anguilla and has been talking to some of the islanders. That's where a lot of my family live. They've migrated from Anguilla for maybe centuries. So that's why I'm concerned as to what will happen after Brexit. And we didn't vote. But that's the price we pay for being a overseas territory. Do you feel British? <laughs> Am I British? Can I openly say that and feel comfortable that I'm a British person? Or are we just a, a little dot hanging with a name that is not really true to us? My name is Nisha Dupi and I live in Britain, or a part of it called Anguilla. Across the sea, 10 miles away is France or St. Martin, a French and Dutch island. We are closer, more reliant on it even than Britain is to France. A large part of our transport, food and health services come from St. Martin. Last year, Anguilla was hit by Hurricane Irma, but the big storm this year is Brexit. Will we be cut off from the European neighbor we so depend on? Anguilla and St. Martin is like brother and sister, or brother and brother. <laughs> you know, it's, um, we depend on each other. Do you ever find yourself having to like go to St. Martin to use any of the services? Oh yes, all the time. You know, the health services, medicine. My wife, she depends on them very strongly. Uh, she has to take certain med medication every day of her life. So she has to go there for that. Do you feel that in light of all of this, Anguillian should have been consulted? At least we were would have been treated as uh, human beings, like people recognize that we are here, you know, and, and that we, our lives value something. Anguilla is heavily dependent on neighboring St. Mo right. So just to point out in the event of a no-deal Brexit, um, Anguilla will have an instant illegalized or refugee population of 15,000 people, um, which is something that can be taken into account, is changeable, right? Um, but hasn't been changed. 
In the meantime, Anguilla's population decreased um, from almost 17,000 people in 2016 to um, less than 15,000 in 2018 as people migrate in search of a less risky future. So to conclude, the perspective here of Europe otherwise has meant to emphasize the creolization of Europe through the Caribbean as one way, an option, out of periodically producing anomalies and exceptions to a singular European norm. And I want to suggest that um, instead of explaining away forgotten Europe's that surface in times of crisis, such as the hurricanes or Brexit, we could use the crisis as a magnifying lens for exposing ongoing colonial entanglements, becoming aware, at least as late as now, of the fact that colonial possessions of Europe in the 21st century are part of the rule and not exceptions. And to end with a quote by Haitian anthropologist Michel Rose Trouillot, the lessons learned from the Caribbean are applicable elsewhere. As a historical process inherently tied to modernization, modernity necessarily creates its alter native in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and in areas of the world where the archetypal Caribbean history story repeats itself with variations on the theme of destruction and creolization." End of quote. So for once, as Europe otherwise, the elsewhere to which lessons apply is Europe, and why not let it be the other? Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manuela. Brexit just got even more complicated than we thought it was. That's, I said it would be stimulating. That's a great deal to think about and talk about there. And now we can go and do that over a glass of wine. So if we'd like to thank both our plenary speakers again. Thank you very much.